Drake Show coming to you direct from beautiful Buena Park, California. Uh, we had a little bit of rain earlier this week. We have more rain coming in this week, but tomorrow is supposed to be nice. Because this is the Thanksgiving Eve show, I thought we ought to start by talking about what the heck Thanksgiving is. It is a perfect example that we students in public school were misled as to what it was. It was a very religious celebration. And to put down the liberal progressive media who doesn't want to deal with uh, religion, doesn't want to think that our country is uh, Christian based with Christian roots, I'm going to do something interesting. I'm a history buff. I also believe that if it's in writing, it's important. So as a result of that, what I'm going to do to start off today's show is, uh, I think most of us know that the first president of the United States of America was George Washington. I'm pretty sure we think about that. And George Washington gave a Thanksgiving proclamation October 3rd, 1789. So not too long after the country got up and rolling. Uh, following a resolution from Congress, President George Washington proclaimed Thursday, the 26th of November, 1789, a day of public thanksgiving and prayer devoted to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficial author of all, the good that was, that is, or that will be. Reflecting on American religious practices, presidents and congresses from the beginning of the Republic have from time to time designated days of fasting and thanksgiving. The thanksgiving holiday we continue to celebrate in November was established by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War and was made to law in 1941, right before the other big world war. And setting aside the day for Thanksgiving, Washington established a non-sectarian tone for the devotions and stressed political, moral, and intellectual blessings that made self-government possible. Okay, we're kind of catching the tone here. In addition to the personal and national repentance, hmm, I think we've been hearing that lately, although the First Amendment prevents Congress from establishing a religion or prohibits its free exercise, presidents as well as Congress have always recognized American regard for sacred practices and beliefs. Thus, throughout American history, presidents have offered a non-sectarian prayers for victory of the military and in wake of catastrophes transcending passionate quarrels over the proper role of religion in politics. Thanksgiving proclamation reminds us of how natural the relationship has been. While church and state are separate, religion and politics, in their American refinement, each props up the other. Here is the actual proclamation. By the President of the United States, a proclamation. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have, by their joint committee, requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of the state to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficial, beneficent author of all good that was, that is, or will be that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care, protection, people of this country, previous to it becoming a nation, for the signal, uh, for the signal and manifold mercies and favor, able impositions of his providence in the course and conclusion of the late war, Revolutionary War, <clears throat> for the great degree of tank tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed for the peaceable, rational manner 
in which he, we have been able to establish the constitutions of government for our safety, happiness, and particularly the national one lately instituted, for the civil and religious liberty which we are blessed, and the means we have for acquiring and diffusing useful knowledge, and in general, for all the great and various favors which he has been pleased to confer upon us. And also, we may unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations, and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions, to enable us, whether in private or public station, to perform our several and relative duties properly, punctually, to render our national garden, uh, government as a blessing to all the people by constantly being a government of wise, just, and constitutional laws, discreetly and faithfully executing and obeying, to protect and guide all sovereigns and nations, especially those that have shown kindness to us, and to bless them with good governments, peace, and concord to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue, mm -hmm. and to increase the science among us, and generally to grant unto all mankind a degree of temporal prosperity that he alone knows best. Given under my hand, the city of New York, the third day of October, in the year of our Lord, 1789, George Washington. And folks, for your benefit, uh, you notice that was in New York. That's when the capital of the United States was in New York. Absolutely. Not in Washington. But uh, what a great, great proclamation of the gospel. Not only of thanksgiving, but of the gospel. Because it goes from point to point about the fact that God is such a loving God, and God is a caring God, and God is a just God. All of those things about God that that proclamation said, and we still are celebrating that these many years later. Even better than that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to not so politely make an observation. On social media, we have literally been inundated with two things. One, the liberal progressives saying that the United States of America is not a Christian nation. <laughs> Number two, some guy by the name of Barry Saturo Obama saying that it was the Muslim religion that our country was based on. Ladies and gentlemen, you can have any opinion you want. You can have an opinion that the, cheese, the moon is made out of green cheese. You can have... Whatever. I thought it was yellow cheese. Well, Go it ahead. depends on the time of the year. Go ahead. <laughs> you can have whatever opinion you want, but if you lie to me and to others, if you say things that you knowing unintelligently are false, not only are you violating my rights to the truth, violating the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness, and otherwise just showing that you have no morals, no ethics, and no religious basis, you're pretty well making me extremely upset. Mm -hmm. Here is the very first president of the United States, the general of the Revolutionary Army that defeated Britain and got America moving forward. Here is his Thanksgiving proclamation that in absolutely, positively, no uncertain terms whatsoever says God is why we're here. That's right. <clears throat> so I do not want to hear any more about this ridiculous thing of, oh, America has nothing to do with religion, has nothing to do with it. Now, I will make the observation that in his proclamation, he doesn't mention Jesus Christ. I will notice that. But it does say that he was being non-sectarian. I understand that. But he certainly was talking about the one and only God, and he certainly was talking about the blessings of the one and only God. So as a result, the rest of it just makes no sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. So the next time somebody says, well, uh, how do you know that we're a religious nation and we have a religious origin? Well, why do you mention that? Because I'm going to talk about something in just a second, but I'll end up by saying, gee, when was the last time you read the Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation? 
Mm-hmm. Now, you may say, why are you, what are you thinking about now? I said, let me go back to that. If you remember, way back in ancient history and on more than one occasion, Dr. Drake has said that America's birth certificate was the Mayflower Compact. That's right. And we know that that was the pilgrims who did that. And we know it was the pilgrims who started the ceremony of Thanksgiving. <clears throat> well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? What you were taught Thanksgiving was and what Thanksgiving really is, two different things. Mm. It turns out that what motivated the pilgrims way back in the 1600s to come to the United States was the Holy Bible. They used as guidance for leaving uh, Holland and Britain and coming to America the Israelites leaving Egypt to start a new nation. And that is what their motivation and belief was. But for the Bible, they wouldn't be here. Yes. When they got here, oh, they had some problems. Half of the pilgrims died the first year they were here. Mm. They had no food. It was cold. They didn't know where they were. Things got really bad. And it certainly is correct that the Indians helped them, taught them how to farm, taught them how to do a few other things. And... In a very short period of time, the pilgrims became so successful, they were able to pay off the loan that bought the boat, that brought them here, that the merchants back in both Holland and Britain had lent money for the pilgrims to come over here. They were able to pay all of that back. And so the thanksgiving was not merely gratitude to the Indians, it was a recognition of the power of their faith in God and Jesus Christ and the Bible that led them to their new world and new country. Amen. That is what Thanksgiving is. Amen. It is a humble thank you to God and nothing else powerful, more powerful than that. So anybody that tells you, oh, they were just trying to be nice to the Indians, no, they were being thankful for the Lord our God. Amen. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, we've come a long way. In fact, I'm going to share with you a press release that was put out uh, by a man by the name of Don Otis. Now, I don't know Don, but I believe Don has said some very profound things. The title of his thing is, and you can find it, by the way, on ChristianNewsWire.com, ChristianNewsWire.com, and here's what he says. Most Christians, now that's today, most Christians believe in the importance of spiritual growth, but are not actively engaged in discipleship. Christ's message for transformation still resonates, but most lack an understanding of what steps to take to grow in their faith. Just close by over here, this pastor Don Otis in Carson, California says, the majority of people who claim to be followers of Christ say they want to grow spiritually. 77% said, yes, I want to grow spiritually. Yet, a small percentage of these adults are involved in some kind of discipleship activity. Only 20%. It's that old 80-20 rule. 80% say things, but 20% are really the ones that do something. There's a disconnect between what Christians say is important and what they actually do. Discipleship is designed to move people from religion to a relationship. And this emphasis on discipleship is correlated with a higher faith. So why don't people participate in discipleship? Why are we reluctant to join opportunities to grow our faith? Past generations of Americans clearly understood what it meant to follow Christ, to grow in faith, and live a godly life. And I'm going to share with you a dear friend of mine I shared about this morning, and her name is Janet Porter. Janet Porter believes, as all of us do, that we ought to do something. Janet Porter woke me up this morning, not intentionally, but I was just getting up 
and I turned my computer on and I saw her press release that said, how stupid do you think we are? And I thought, well, I should check that out. And she went on to say, when Senator, now we're talking about Senators early in the morning out here in California, when Senator Larry Obhoffs, O-B-H-O-F-S, Obhoffs, aide told Barbara that he is concerned the heartbeat bill doesn't protect from conception. Barbara said, how stupid do you think we are? Well, tell Senator Obhoff, you're not buying it, folks. He co-sponsored the pain-capable bill, which doesn't protect from conception and protects far fewer babies than the heartbeat bill, which will protect tens of thousands of babies that would be murdered each year. And don't buy Senate President Faber's excuse about the courts. We will have a brand new court in the Supreme Court building to hear our heartbeat bill with pro-life justices appointed by President-elect Donald Trump, we hope. We want you to do something, folks. The other article we talked about a while ago, it said a lot of people say, yeah, I believe something, but are they willing to put feet to their prayers? I'll never forget a number of years ago when I'd been doing this show only for a few years, I was worried and had some people say, well, you need to be careful the name of your organization and what you do and how you do it because you don't want to get a bad reputation. Well, I got up again one of those early mornings when some things were going on, and I found out that people uh, really were not doing anything. All oh, they were wringing their hands, they were quoting different people, but not really doing anything. And so I put out a press release that said, listen, I wasn't on television then, it was only on the radio. I said, listen to Wiley Drake on the radio this morning. He has a question for you. And here is the question that I gave them. Do you really give a damn? And oh boy, my phone lines lit up. We don't think a preacher ought to be saying that word. Well, Jesus said it. But the bottom line is, I said it for a reason. I wanted to get their attention because I was learning that a lot of people who claim to be very spiritual, claim to be very heavenly minded, some of them are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. And so I said, if you really give a damn, you'll do something. And so we asked people to do something. That's what this show is all about. And that's what our dear sister, Janet Porter, some of you knew her, Janet Folger, but Janet Porter is her married name now, and uh, she is one of those people who picked up on how stupid do you think we are and picked up on this about putting boots on the ground. We have a saying here in reference to prayer and in reference to doing something. It's one thing to be against an enemy. It's another thing to put your boots on the ground. So I'm asking you, when you pray with us, put your boots on the ground and your prayers in the air. Now, Janet Porter is a prayer warrior, extraordinaire, and she puts boots on the ground all the time. We've put boots on the ground together in Washington and all across this nation. But these boots, Remember that one song, these boots are made for walking and that's just what they're going to do? Well, these boots are made for praying and these boots are made for calling. There's something you can do. No more excuses. Tell them to bring the heartbeat bill to the floor. The heartbeat bill simply says, if there's a heartbeat, it's a baby. And that baby should be protected. No more excuses, no more lies, no more thinking we're stupid. There's two things I want you to do. 
Number one, I want you to pray. P-R-A-Y. And then I want you to get up off your knees and get up off the couch and put your boots on the ground. Go over to your cell phone or to your iPad or your landline and call Senate President Mr. Faber. Call Keith Faber and say enough is enough. We want you to fight and quit murdering babies. And you need to call him and tell him that. By the way, he is the president of the Senate, Mr. Keith Faber, and I would encourage you to call him. I'm going to give you his telephone number. His telephone number is 614-466-7584. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have an excuse now. You can pick up the phone anytime, even on Thanksgiving Day, because guess what, folks? You can leave them a message. You don't have to be in Washington. It's great when you can be. By the way, I'm going to be there. We're going to talk about this later, but I'm going to be in Washington on January the 20th for the presidential inaugural prayer breakfast. I hope you'll join me. But in the meantime, go to work. Put your boots on the ground. Call Senate President Faber, Keith Faber, at 614-466-7584. And say, no more excuses. Bring the heart bill, the heartbeat bill, to the floor. Let's vote on it. Let's see how the vote will go. Bring it, Mr. Senate President. Keith Farber, I'm going to call him several times, already have and will continue to do so. Call him on 614-466-7584. And there's another senator that you need to call as well. His name is Orbhoff, O-B, Obhoff. O-B-H-O-F. And Senator, if I mispronounced your name, I apologize. Please forgive me. But Senator Obhoff, O-B-H-O-F, needs to get a phone call from every one of us. And I'll ask the same question I asked years ago. Do you really give a damn? If you do, you'll call these men. And do they really think we're that stupid? If you don't call, they're thinking you're stupid. Call Keith Faber, indeed the president of the Senate, and say to him on 614-466-7584, enough is enough. No more baby murdering. No more baby murdering. Oh, I know some of you people want to be nice. I know some of you people want to be politically correct and I know you want me to use terms like terminate a baby or abortion those are all what we call in Arkansas SOS words stuck on stupid you see ladies and gentlemen when they rip a baby's arms and legs off and its nose and face off that's murder the Bible says thou shalt not commit murder the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not kill. In fact, I remember a number of years ago, we, uh, I went down to stand with uh, Governor Roy Moore about the Ten Commandments monument being removed. And when I got back, my dear sweet wife said, Honey, why don't we have a Ten Commandments monument up out in front of our church? And I said, Well, I hadn't thought about it, but thank you. I believe the Holy Spirit led her to ask me that question, as he did many times. And so I ordered from a company, a monument company, uh, to build us some Ten Commandment tablets. And I was so excited because I was following the Lord. And when the Ten Commandments tablet got here, the one commandment that says, Thou shalt not murder, was wrong. It said, Thou shalt not kill. And I told the guy, take it back. I want one that's accurate. 
The Bible doesn't say, he said, well, that's what's in the Bible. I said, I don't care. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say thou shalt not kill. The Bible says thou shalt not murder. There's a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, as a teenage boy, I was in the rice paddies and in the ocean around Vietnam. And I used a military weapon. And I killed people. I killed people. And because somebody had said, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, I was on a guilt trip until I understood. I didn't, I didn't just kill them. I did my duty as a member of the United States military. And to kill somebody that was trying to kill me was not a sin. To kill somebody is justified in many cases. That's why Jesus said three things you ought to do about the bad guys. Number one, pray. Number two, prepare. Number three, arm yourself. And we encourage you to do that. And by the way, we not only encourage you to arm yourself, we encourage you folks to be reasonable and get trained. You don't just pick up a gun and say, well, I'm armed. You don't know how to load it. You don't know what to do. Or if somebody comes in your house with a weapon, they're armed, what do you do? And uh, I want Mr. Davis to tell us a little bit about our program that will bring you to a level of alertness that will make you a decent soldier in God's army. And that alert program is what he's going to tell you about right now. Ladies and gentlemen, is one of the things that you probably figured out, uh, Dr. Drake and I kind of do this show uh, on the uh, roll, and so sometimes there may seem like a little bit of a glitch, and it's just that things develop quickly, and we try to get as much information to you. So yes, I'm going to tell you about the alert program and some stuff that's coming up with that, but before I get started, I am extremely disturbed that a member of the legislature, Congress, has says that violence is going to come to Donald Trump, the president-elect, if he shuts down federal funding for Planned Parenthood. Now, in case you aren't aware of it, Planned Parenthood is the genocide that was started by Margaret Sanger. She has killed, she and the followers of Margaret Sanger's have killed millions of babies. Yes. Many of them are African American. Why? Because Margaret Sanger hated African Americans. She has killed more people than the Nazis have killed. So if you ladies and gentlemen want to threaten Trump because he wants to stop a genocide, man, when you get up to the pearly gates and you're standing before the throne to get judged, I really want to be there because I want to hear that judgment. Amen. Now, get back to what the uh, pastor just said. We have become so sensitive to the threats that are constantly being published. We have people that are involved in the government, were involved in the government, are dealing with it, and so our intel um, gathering is fairly significant. It's something that we do every single day. We're not just sitting around twiddling our thumbs wondering, gee, what's going to happen next? Right. No, we keep track of what's going on. As a result of that, we are very aware of the fact that not once, not twice, but three times, various intel agencies and security agencies of both the United States government and other government agencies have put us, we the people, on an orange alert. They are talking about a terrorist attack tomorrow at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. They are talking about terrorist attacks at malls, shopping malls, churches, and other places where people gather. On Channel 5 News today, they showed a very scary video where a guy came into a convenience store to rob it. The clerk decided to try to take him out. The clerk was unarmed. The bad guy was armed. The clerk put up a heck of a fight. Fortunately, the crook did not shoot the clerk. 
but the clerk afterwards admitted that man he didn't know what he was doing he just was really upset and that he had to do something well ladies and gentlemen <clears throat> while I can understand why the clerk of the store wanted to do that I can tell you doing that without training probably not a good idea so as a result of that we are filling in that gap and the gap we are filling in is alert and alert stands for awareness learning escape refuge and takedown it is an active shooter self-defense class it is how you survive when things go bad when you're in a gun free zone and the bad guy shows up how do you survive that's what we teach so we have now associated with a couple of other groups one of which is civilian arms training source and uh, the other one is the congressional prayer conference of washington dc so what we ask you to do is our next class is coming up december 17th um, you can text me anytime at 951-261-0799 put in the word alert your name and number and I will get a hold of you to get you signed up for the class. Now, the date for that is December the 17th. 17th, that and that's a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And it would be 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 p.m., although our last class, which was last Saturday, the people got so enthused, we wound up going a little bit past 4 o'clock. But they were having a good time, and I wasn't going to break up the party. Yeah. They were having Amen. a good time. <laughs> I was amazed that one of our students was a, uh, how do I say this politely, very mature lady and was she good at doing takeaways huh. i was amazed amen and uh, she uh, let, let's see now um she'd have been very I, don't, I know how to say it politely she would have been very comfortable dating pastor drake no. there would have been no age problem if she decided to date pastor drake okay so that's about as polite as i could say that okay so anyway but she was still able to do and it. everybody knows that pastor drake has been a widower for now six years and is certainly open to the suggestion of dating. I was just making an observation of age without having to actually give an age. I was oh, trying okay. to be politically correct, which is kind of scary. Um, now, let me tell you something else. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this would be a great Christmas present. Yes, absolutely. How to save some your life, the lives of your family, great Christmas present. Now, let me tell you what's really interesting. Um, if you sign up in advance, you get coffee, rolls, lunch, along with a great handout um, book on how to do all of this, it's a whopping $50. If you show up at the actual class, and because we have to then start shuffling around to get things going, unfortunately we've got to go up to $75. Um, if you want to bring your kids and have your kids sit on it, we'll give you a heck of a discount for them. Kids 12 and older are welcome, and ladies, women, and they're all welcome. We'd love Amen. to have you. Um, the next thing I want to remind you of, and this is very important, the law in California on a lot of firearms issue is changing quickly come January 1, 2017. To this weekend, literally, at the weekend after Thanksgiving, this coming weekend, we are having the gun show, the Crossroads of the West gun show, at the um, Orange County Fairgrounds. Amen. Um, Pastor Drake and I will be manning the guardian of the oath table. We are a pro-constitution, pro-police, fire and first responders group. Um, we're going to be there. We're trying to get people educated on what the constitution is and right. how to protect it. We'll be next to the booth for the civilian arms training source. And if you show up at the gun show to take their level one combat self-defense pistol course, you're going to get a heck of a discount for it. So I strongly advise, recommend, invite you to that gun show. And we would encourage you to come and give your testimony. I'm going to be asking one question. I'm going to be on the ground. I'm going to be on location, boots on the ground, with camera in hand. And I'm going to ask a simple question. I won't ask you your name. I won't ask any background. I'll simply ask, why are you at a gun show? And I would love to hear your response to that question. I know why I'm going to the gun show. I'm going to the gun show to encourage people uh, to follow Jesus. Jesus said, pray, prepare, and arm yourself. 
And so that's why I'm going to the gun show, one reason. Another reason is, uh, recently when I bought a weapon, they did not have the ammunition for it. And so I'm going to the gun show to get some ammo. And I would encourage you to be there. And while I'm there, I'm going to be doing a live broadcast, and I will ask you to answer the same question. Why are you here? Why are you here at the gun show? And we'd love to have you on television giving your testimony. So come on down. Be on the Wiley Drake Show with us. Be at the gun show. Make some purchases. Do whatever you feel led to do. But we do encourage you to come. Now I want to go back again to what Janet Porter said, and that is, please make this phone call. Get your pen out, get your tablet out, whatever you take notes on, and put these two names and these two telephone numbers down so you can use them. And by the way, you don't have to wait till Monday. You don't have to wait till the holiday's over. In fact, I would just encourage you, when you've been there with the family on Thanksgiving and you've had a lot of turkey to eat, and you've had a lot of cranberry sauce and whatever else it is you have a lot of on Thanksgiving. I would encourage you as you're sitting back relaxing, basking in your overeating or your over drinking, I would suggest you simply get up and make a, make a walk into the other room or outside with your cell phone and simply say, I'm going to make this phone call. Now, you're not going to get a live person. They're doing turkey just like you are. But you will get an answering service. They will be polite, I assure you of that, because I've already called them and they were. But if you call these numbers, you don't have to say, well, I ain't get, get nobody on Thanksgiving. Yes, you will. You can leave a message. You simply say to them when they answer, my name is Wiley Drake from California. And I want to say to Senate President Faber, no more excuses. Bring the heartbeat bill to the floor. And I'd also call Senator Oberhoff and say the same thing. My name's Wiley Drake, and I'm calling you from California. And I encourage you, bring the heartbeat bill to the floor for a vote. We're not trying to tell you how to vote. We just are asking for to bring it to the floor. We're not going to tell... Senate President Faber how to vote. We're not going to tell Senator Obhoff how to vote. We're just going to say, please vote to bring it to the floor so it can be voted on. Now remember that the Congress is going on their holiday break within the next six days. So if this is going to get voted on before uh, Christmas, you got to move now. Yes. If not, it'll be next year before we get back. So there is a little bit of a time constraint, so let's uh, push it if we're going to get it done. And if you go online, you can get an email for them. I don't have their emails right here in front of me, but if you just go online, uh, if you go to Janet Folger's uh, uh, web, that's uh, JanetPorter at gmail.com. You can email her and get in touch with her. But the bottom line is you can get uh, Senate President Faber Keith Faber's email says send an email to him send him an email and just make it short and sweet say no more excuses please bring the heartbeat bill to the floor now before those six days that our dear friend shared with us about a while ago give you those two phone numbers again you can call today tomorrow during the holidays whenever but please call them and say please bring this to the floor call senate president faber at 614-466-7584 call senator obhoff 614-466-7505 call them and say hey bring the bill out so it can be voted on. Friends, if it don't come out, they can't vote on it. So I would encourage you, please, encourage them to vote on it. Put your boots on the ground and your phone in your hand and go to battle. And in thinking and talking about battle, I have an instrument of battle here. It's not a weapon, 
but it is a call to weaponry. It is a call to battle. And God said, sound the trumpet in Zion. And the word for trumpet is shofar. And I'm going to sound the shofar to challenge you to be a part, put boots on the ground, and prayer in the air. <laughs> Join us, by the way, because we're going to be boots on the ground in Washington, D.C. January the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. Those are four days of battle cry, four days of battle call, four days of prayer, four days of on-location prayer meetings. Come and join us. There's two ways you can join us. One way is to be boots on the ground. Be there with us on Capitol Hill. If you can't do that, you're not close enough to there, or you can't come, then you can call us on our call-in line. We have a call-in line that's open right now. You can call us right now. But that prayer line will be open from Capitol Hill. It'll be open at 12 noon and 8 p.m. The 17th the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th. Please come and meet. Let's share together. You come to Capitol Hill, I might even buy you lunch in the cafeteria of the Supreme Court. So come on down and join us. Most of all, pray with us, pray for us. Come and hear the shofar blown. Come and hear my correspondent, Johnny Rice, Minister Johnny Rice. Come and hear him blow the other Pastor Drake Congressional Prayer Conference shofar because we have one shofar for the Congressional Prayer Conference with Wiley Drake's name on it, and it's assigned permanently to Capitol Hill. And so, come and hear Johnny Rice blow what he calls the daddy of the shofars and the other <laughs> shofar that he bought. He calls it the kid shofar. But come and hear Minister Johnny Rice share what God has led him to teach in reference to end times. You heard my pastor this morning talking about end times, talking about the tribulation period. Folks, that's coming. According to the Bible, it's coming. And you need to be ready, and I need to be ready. Come to Capitol Hill with us and hear the shofar blown and hear us challenge the rest of the people to call up their senators and their representatives and to pray with them and to pray for them. So do you have anything else, Mr. Davis, that you'd like to share at this time? It is getting to be interesting about what's going on one of the things that came totally unexpected, and I'm, I'm a little embarrassed because I try to keep track of what's going on in the news and politics, um, and yet out of the clear blue sky, it was announced today that Dr. Ben Carson is going to become the Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, and that is a cabinet level position. And if you all remember, not too far back, um, Dr. Drake had Ben Carson on his show and uh, got to hear questions and answer and some interesting things. Amen. Uh, initially, Dr. Carson said that he wasn't going to be in the cabinet, and then all of a sudden, voila, uh, housing and urban development. Now, let me tell you why this is interesting. It was the housing and urban development department that caused the recession of 2008. It was because they were forcing lenders to do subprime loans, lend money to people to buy houses who could not afford to make the loan payments back that destroyed our economy in 2008. Guess what? HUD is still doing it. HUD is still playing games with that. I have a sneaking suspicion that if Ben Carson thought that it was important enough to change his mind and become a cabinet member 
under Trump, I have a sting suspicion that things that HUD are going to change. Amen. I agree with you. And ladies and gentlemen, we're here to give you the real news. The news is happening. We are here to talk about Janet Porter as a warrior, lady warrior, and men who are warriors as well, like uh, Minister Johnny Rice and so forth. And I'm here also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as all of you know, I consider myself uh, to be cross-denominational, but because of my Baptist roots, I quite often are bringing up something from the Southern Baptist Convention. First of all, let me say, some of you may not even know about it, the Southern Baptist Convention is 15 million people that name the name of Jesus. We are a large group. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention, Brother Frank Page was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention when I was second vice president, and so he was my boss. I want to share with you something that he put out from Nashville. This is from Frank Page. And the title of the article is Principles, Pragmatism, Motivated the Voters. Brother Frank Page says, Americans went to bed, if they went to bed at all, stunned with the news of November the 8th election. The same Americans woke up the next morning, if they slept at all, stunned with the news of the election from the night before. We now await, Frank says, we now await the elite to tell us what happened and why Americans voted as they did. Let me let me address that, ladies and okay, gentlemen, because this is important to understand. Let me tell you why the snowflakes, great term, I love that term, snowflakes, the liberal, progressive, millennial students, why they are so unhappy, guess what? It's because their teachers have been lying to them. Their teachers have been lying to them for years, telling them how wonderful they are, how they can know everything, how they control everything. And the unfortunately, the teacher didn't tell them the truth that, oh, by the way, there is a sleeping giant called yeah. we the people who are going to get tired of this, and when we arise, things are going to be unhappy. Well, guess what? We arose. Trump yeah. got elected, yeah. and now these snowflakes are melting and whining. What happened? What happened? What happened? You're the victim of being lied to. Go back to your teachers, slap them upside the head and say, why did you lie to me? Now, let me put out a disclaimer here. What? My producer is suggesting that you go slap somebody upside the head. And we do not... Figuratively. Figuratively yes. speaking. All right. Figuratively. All Always right. figuratively. All right. All right. But I wanted to make sure that nobody is going to go away and say, why this producer said go slap somebody upside the head? Well, I did something kind of sort of worse than that. What's that? Well, the, on Facebook, they're, they, they have a picture of Obama, and it has a caption on it that says, what do you want me to do on my last day in office? Oh. Okay. I, I, I sent him a message. What? Commit seppuku on the front lawn of the White House. No. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, Americans did wake up after the election. And few, Frank Page says, would ask his analysis. And few would ask for the analysis of Mr. Davis or myself. But we're going to give it anyway. Americans voted out of principle, but also out of pragmatism. This is the way it has always been. In a republic such as ours, rarely if ever have believers been able to choose the perfect candidate. It was not so yesterday on the 8th, and it will not be so in the future elections, Frank Page says. Millions, did you hear that word? Millions of Baptists went to the polls, and I'm so proud of my Baptist family, and they voted out of principles, not out of politics, not out of party, but they voted principles and out of pragmatism. 
They wanted to vote for a candidate that might support cherished principles among believers, especially Baptists, ignoring the condescending verbiage from the moral elites, Baptists voted and voted in droves. And as my mama used to say, Mama, how many Baptists voted? And she would say, a bunch voted. You can listen to what the moral elites tell us, but Christians still make a difference. Southern Baptists have not gone by the wayside when it comes to exercising our civic responsibility and this Southern Baptist Church and this Southern Baptist pastor will not overlook we will pray for our new president whether you like him or not or do or don't we will as Baptists pray for our new president I pray every day for our current president I know some of you find that hard to believe because I've been so quote anti-Obama I had a lady attorney on the phone with me the other day and said, did you vote for Trump? I said, no. She said, what do you think about Obama? I said, I think he was a crook. My pastor calls him a long-legged Mac daddy. And she found out very quickly that I wasn't too enamored by the current president. But I still pray for him every day. I pray imprecatory prayer. I pray all kinds of prayer for him. And finally, I pray that he'll come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Because it's pretty obvious to me he loves Allah and Buddha and whoever else, but he doesn't love Jesus. Well, we must remember the words of the word of God. 1 Timothy 2.1 says, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks on thanksgiving be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority like Obama that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and reverence. We will pray, already have for our new elected leader. We will pray for him to follow the paths of righteousness. We will encourage and speak into his life as best we know how. We're going to ask him, three or four things and then I'll turn it over to Brother David. Well, we're gonna ask may not be safe. Him, we're going to ask him to keep his word and provide religious liberty for all religions. We're going to ask him to protect the life of the unborn children and quit murdering babies. We're going to encourage him to protect marriage as between a man and a woman. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Hey, we're going to ask him to nominate Supreme Court judges who will protect the Constitution and not put activists and their agendas in there. Go right ahead. Do you know who Jeffrey Dahmer is? Yes. Okay. For those of you that don't know, Jeffrey Dahmer was a mass murderer, serial killer, cannibal. Um, fortunately, he got into prison and got killed very quickly. Somebody has sent us a joke. As you know, I do not think very highly of either Al Sharpton or uh, uh, Jesse Jackson. And although they claim to be um, um, members of the cloth, I don't believe either of those uh, fit that definition. However, somebody sent us a very interesting meme, which is calling Al Sharpton a reverend is like calling Jeffrey Dahmer a chef. <laughs> okay. Okie dokie. I like that. I like well, it. ladies and gentlemen, what are we going to do? I hope you'll make your phone calls. I hope you'll do what you can. But let me tell you something else. We, he and I and other Southern Baptists, Southern Baptists and Evangelical Christians will, not maybe, not coulda, shoulda, woulda, but we will continue to witness to the lost people who are on their way to hell. And we will minister to the hurting in the shelter here at the church. We will minister to the dispossessed and the displaced. 
will be the first to react in times of national and local crisis. And we have the Southern Baptist Disaster Team that proves that every time they go out. And we will continue to speak up. We will continue to speak up for the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many who like to analyze and funeralize. I like that word, Frank. Frank says people are funeralizing the country. Those who stood for righteousness whether in the majority or not, conservative Southern Baptist Christians will continue to remember that the Lord is the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, and we are to do what he tells us to do, and do it we will. Ladies and gentlemen, come back to be with us again tomorrow on Thanksgiving Day, yes, we're going to do our program at 9 o'clock, and we would invite you to come back. Now, I'm going to uh, go over to the other side of the console, and I'm going to let Mr. Davis have the last statement. You've got about three or four minutes, brother. Go ahead and take us home. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to ask of you is certainly we would be foolish to believe that everybody is as dedicated to the Christian faith and religion as we are. And certainly one of our duties as pastors and preachers is to try to bring people into the flock so that they can be saved. But I am going to ask a special request. When you sit around the table, Thanksgiving, with your family, even if it's not your normal practice, this one day of the year, say a prayer. Thank God for what you have received. Thank Christ for what He has done. Thank uh, Him for your ability to be with your family on this day. And just give a little bit of consideration for what it is that you have received, why America is great, and why Thanksgiving, in my humble opinion, is one of the most important holidays of the year. Thank you. Good night and have a happy Thanksgiving.